water harvesting. Um, I'm going to be giving an overview on a, a, a few different things, but just to give you a little bit of a background of what we do, we're a contracting firm that also does design work that focuses on mostly rainwater catchment systems, but also stormwater management as a whole. So the familiarity that we have is in uh, rain gardens and bioretention as much as it is in, is in rainwater catchment systems. Uh, and so what we're gonna be touching on in this uh, uh, conversation, this presentation is gonna be rainwater harvesting and stormwater management as a holistic approach. And uh, I'd like to start with discussing some of the issues surrounding uh, water that we have locally here in the Pacific Northwest, but it's really something that we deal with on a on national and even a global scale. But uh, water quality and water quantity issues, uh, we're gonna touch on those. We're going to discuss a little bit about our approach uh, as to when we calculate the volume of rainwater and how much we're trying to either catch and retain to be reused uh, or to mitigate and uh, manage so that it doesn't cause pollution and, and things like that. So we're going to talk a little bit about calculating uh, rainwater volume and how we do that. Uh, and then we're going to touch on the difference between passive rainwater harvesting and active rainwater harvesting uh, and, and uh, uh, what the differences are. Uh, and just kind of how we approach that uh, and what we're looking at when we're discussing that in relation to water quantity and water quality issues. So uh, this slide here is uh, just an overview. It's a nice cartoon, a nice graphic that discusses uh, or just illustrates uh, water source problems or things that uh, I'd imagine a lot of folks already know or that you might have seen in some of the other classes uh, uh, or other presentations, but uh, when we have runoff or rainwater uh, that runs over impervious surfaces or things like roads and uh, uh, fields and, and uh, 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 unstable slopes and, and things that can cause erosion, you're going to get contaminants and pollutants that add to uh, or that flow into water bodies or that flow into water sources. And so uh, that's what this illustration uh, 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 demonstrates here. I kind of like it because it, you know, it just you know, shows you the old you know, uh, thing that, okay, well, we have the runoff, we have manure, we have soil, we have fertilizers that go into uh, our water sources. And then what does that mean? So uh, when we're looking at water quantity and water quality issues, uh, I guess starting with water quantity problems, uh, this picture right here, was taken uh, from, I think it was mid-November or so, whenever we had one of those major storm events. Uh, and it just shows water over the roadway, uh, too much water, a volume for a specific stormwater structure or a specific stormwater uh, drainage, a ditch or what have you, uh, to manage to be able to manage that water. So then it overflows uh, and then you get instances like this on a small scale. And then in a large scale, you can get flood events and things uh, uh, that uh, certainly Whatcom County experienced, and I know other areas uh, this past year, but very uh, familiar to here in the Pacific Northwest. So water quantity issues, too much rainwater, uh, too many impervious surfaces and that rainwater collecting and then the stormwater systems being overwhelmed. When we're talking about uh, water quantity issues, water quality problems, we're thinking if you've been in a rural area or you've gotten your water source off of a well, uh, or uh, other things, then uh, uh, you know, from municipal locations, you might have an active you know, carbon filter or those kinds of things. But water quantity issues being uh, uh, you know, indicative of it hardness or scaling or those kinds of things that could uh, um, be a, a, a resulting factor of contaminants or hardness, uh, metals and those things that might be in your water that adds to um, uh, the, the quality issues. If you're on a municipal, if you're getting your water from an association, you may not have these kinds of things uh, or filters or think about this, but on a bigger scale, no matter what, even the water uh, purveyor or the municipality that's giving you your water, they're thinking about the water quality issues that they're getting that water from the water source uh, that they have and that over time. So you know, looking at some of these things, there's this uh, a picture here shows a picture of, you know, silty water in a jar there on your left in the middle, a, car, a, a sediment filter that's got a bunch of iron and sediment and other things that are stuck to it. 
And then another, a new thing that we're starting to see, and uh, if anybody's noticed, but microplastics uh, in the uh, uh, in water sources, groundwater as well, but also we're starting to see that um, uh, in some rainwater too. But uh, so where does our water come from? Uh, this uh, uh, slide here shows you uh, just that, you know, it's a, a graphic at the bottom there. It shows you di different options of where our water comes from, where essentially you, we've got our well water, uh, and then we've got rainwater, and then you've got surface water sources like a lake or things like that. Um, on the right there, if that said uh, lake water, then you'd be pulling from the lake. But um, I like this picture because it shows, uh, okay, well, if you've got a well, what is that intersection between the surface water and the water that, that hits the ground uh, from rainwater, and then how that uh, integrates or how that uh, interflows with that groundwater and eventually makes it down uh, uh, to that column where then you're being then reusing that or and or if that water runs off and then flows directly to the water body and then it's being used like a river or those kinds of things. Um, so our water comes from uh, groundwater, it comes from wells, it comes from lakes, surface water, streams, a municipality, they're pulling their water from one of those locations, uh, but ultimately it's all coming from rainwater, which is that source of, of all fresh water in that sense. So when we're thinking about calculating uh, the volume of rainwater, or like when we're trying to design a rainwater catchment system to meet whatever uh, purpose that we're trying to have that meet, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, the, the volume of water is that uh, square footage or that impervious surface that, uh, it, it, that you would see if you're a bird's eye view looking down. So uh, if you're doing rainwater catchment, you're looking at that bird's eye view of the roof surface itself. Uh, if I was at a normal presentation, I'd be showing this and I'd put up the question. So can anybody answer how much does one inch of rain on a thousand square feet equal? And then I usually get all different kinds of answers and stuff. But of course, we're not going to be able to do that. Uh, so I can't see everybody's faces. But uh, so and and my answer is given away there. So it kind of takes the fun out of it. But we'll move on. So uh, one inch of rain on a thousand square feet will give you roughly 600 gallons of collected rainfall. And that's a true number wherever you are located in the Pacific Northwest or anywhere. And so when an engineer or civil engineer, or even uh, when we're doing calculating rainwater catchment systems, that's the uh, calculation that we're using. So uh, if you're looking at a, a, a road surface, it's the same thing, it's that impervious surface. One inch of rain on a thousand square feet will give you 600 gallons of collected rainfall. Uh, and so when you, when you calculate that and then you put that into perspective, uh, here's a picture of uh, Skagit County and the gradient of color here is purple. So the darker the purple, the heavier the rainfall in that area, the lighter the purple, the, the, the lighter the rainfall. And so Mount Vernon there is illustrated on the left. Uh, and then you've got, of course, you know, Anacortes and things. But what that is showing you is there's, no, there's numbers overlaid in those areas, geographic regions. 1,500 square feet of roof surface, if you have that roof surface or driveway surface, any impervious surface, one inch of rain on that roof surface is going to give you 990 gallons. Well, I've done a little bit of math and I calculated, well, based on how much rainfall you can expect in these specific geographic regions of Skagit County, that's how much rent runoff or how much, how many gallons you collect throughout the year on average in these specific areas. So if you're looking at Anacortes, you're a little over, well, you're, you're almost under 30,000 gallons of collected rainfall, but then you go out to concrete in the foothills in that area and you get a significantly more rainfall per year uh, or annually on that same amount of roof surface is gonna give you more collection. So when we're calculating the volume of rainfall, uh, it, it's very important to us as to where that specific location is because that's going to factor. Uh, even at elevation, you might get different kinds of rainfall. So you can see that there's a significant amount of water that comes off of a roof surface. Uh, and so when we're looking at uh, uh, calculating the volume, we're really taking this into account the geography. Uh, and then that, of course, you know, outside of the Pacific Northwest um, is very unique in its microclimates. Uh, it's the same as true. It just depends on uh, how much rain in that specific area uh, and thinking about that throughout the year. So when we're thinking about stormwater management and uh, how we approach uh, rainwater uh, catchment or rainwater 
systems, uh, then we're, okay, so what does it look like? What does stormwater management look like on the top picture there? You've seen bioretention ponds, people might have noticed these things. Um, there's other approaches like retaining the water in a tank, like in the lower left picture there, and then having a slow release or just trying to retain that water in some way. Uh, and then, you know, looking at it from a landscape approach, uh, a managing stormwater or runoff uh, that would be coming from a road surface, a roof surface, uh, through landscape features or, or uh, uh, approaches through using uh, aggregate materials and things like that in the soil. But any type of rain catchment system, any type of stormwater management system is going to have something, it, several things in common. One of the most important is it's going to have a controlled inlet and it's going to have a controlled overflow. And when I use those terms, what I mean is, is, is that uh, thinking about the volume of water that comes off of that, any impervious surface that you're putting into that stormwater infrastructure is going to uh, uh, determine the size the, of that uh, infrastructure, whether it be a rain garden, like is illustrated there on the right, or a rain tank uh, that you're trying to size for capacity, you're going to have a volume that's coming off that impervious thir surface throughout the year and as much rainfall in that specific area. And then you need to think about the overflow for when that system has these heavy rainstorms and we get way too much quantity that uh, like we did this past year with uh, um, uh, these major, uh, the major storms up here in Whatcom County, where even systems that were designed for 100 year events might have approached that limit and then they uh, uh, met their capacity. So thinking about that overflow, Every system has a controlled inlet and a controlled overflow. Uh, and then it typically what we like to see is, is that those two things uh, are equal or that of course that they manage the same amount of volume in uh, as the same amount of volume out. So uh, when looking at rainwater harvesting and, and how that integrates with low impact development uh, is that key term that uh, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, integrating systems that manage the runoff off of these impervious surfaces using natural elements, uh, as well as that uh, uh, catchment and then that reuse. So uh, that's where that term of passive and the active rainwater harvesting. Uh, passive rainwater harvesting is where uh, you're putting that water, catching it from a roof surface, putting it into the soil directly, uh, and then that soil is then uh, uh, taking up that water, you put plants in it. So a rain garden is a very typical example of passive rainwater harvesting. Uh, it's not, it's, it's uh, putting it to where it's actively being used or it should it, it take that back. It, it's passively sending that water to the soil and then, and then being reused. So bioretention, um, it, when I, th that term bioretention, uh, it could mean uh, these fancy little systems that they put off that have might a few plants or those kinds of things. Uh, uh, in storm ditches uh, uh, or for stormwater controls. Infiltration typically is a dry well. Most folks notice uh, no infiltration is a dry well system. It's basically a hole that's dug in the ground uh, and then uh, a clean drain rock put in uh, with that controlled overflow uh, inlet and then overflow and then dispersion and green roofs. And we'll look at a couple of examples of these and then that active rainwater harvesting, uh, the, the, the rain tanks. Uh, and then uh, at rain barrels. So uh, when I'm going back with passive rainwater harvesting, uh, it's putting that water into the soil. So this picture right here shows uh, the downspout, right? Uh, if you can see, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but underneath the flag there by the front door, uh, the water goes out into this rock swale. And then that rock swale is uh, the, the grating underneath that uh, has that meander around uh, these planting areas. This is early on in the planting area, but the idea is, is to have that water uh, sent through a channel before it goes down the hill so that it spreads that water out into the different planting areas. <clears throat> and when we think of a rain garden, um, I think of, I, I like to think of just a, a, a wet area uh, that you're, you're um, mitigating or you're, you're turning over so that um, plants that would like to be in that wet area can grow in that wet area. So a rain garden could be anything. There are technical terms of what a rain garden should be and the soil chemistry and things like that. But a lot of folks that we work with might just have drainage issues or water problems that they have uh, uh, in their crawl space or things where their downspouts 
uh, or might be adding to that or, or runoff. Uh, and so, uh, you know, thinking rain garden, it's expanding outside of that scope that it needs to meet this technical term. And it's really just adding native plants that would like to be in that area that would otherwise be in a wet area. Uh, and so uh, th this is a picture here of the bottom of the hillside where there's a lot of runoff coming down. Uh, and they were always fighting this grass. They could never grow, let it grow there. And so um, uh, opening this up and just putting native plants in there which want to grow there, and then they flourish and, and they're much larger now than this many years ago. Uh, this picture here is another example of that passive you know, rain garden type system where they had water uh, underneath the, the uh, basement and the, the downspouts didn't extend far enough. And so, um, you know, putting this rain, this uh, rockery in here where the downspout uh, uh, lines go out to the rock and then infiltrate into the soils, uh, a, a typical rain garden, um, but uh, just managing the flow of the volume of water that's coming out and helping to solve some of those drainage issues. Um, here's a picture of a green roof. Uh, over top of a garden shed. Um, and green roofs are just a, 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 a specially designed and specific type of plants that go over top of a roof surface that's been designed for that structure. Uh, and you know, they can be all different shapes and sizes and things like this. This is an example of a smaller green roof, um, but you can see the planting, uh, the sedum mat, uh, and then the, the drain rock on the end, uh, and then the scupper there in the lower left of the picture. <clears throat> so dispersion. Um, dispersion is another example of managing stormwater runoff. And the dispersion system in this picture here is uh, the, drain, uh, the, the clean rock that's down uh, by the woods area here. A dispersion is a trench is basically, it, it, it's essentially a, a shallow trench uh, that's been dug at a certain width and length. Uh, and you run the downspouts, typically downspouts or an, uh, uh, a catch basin into it. Uh, and then uh, it spreads that water throughout the trench itself in that rock. Uh, once it's full, it meets that edge uh, at the lower elevation. And then instead of uh, exiting out of the system as a pipe system, as a river, like a, a concentrated system, it's a sheet flow. So uh, this is where you would put the native plants and plant things and things like that. Uh, so that's a, a very right out of the Washington State Stormwater Management Annual um, for folks that are putting in new impervious surfaces or things like that. So if anybody's gone through a remodel or those kinds of things, they might have uh, had to meet uh, some of these requirements to put in things like this, systems like this. Um, infiltration is another uh, example of an on-site uh, stormwater management tool. Uh, and it, this is an example of an infiltration trench that's been integrated with rain, uh, a rain garden uh, or plants that would otherwise like to be in wet areas. Uh, but the infiltration trench is underneath those co that cobble rock. And so what's on top of the surface of your system could look very different uh, than what's going on underneath. So if you have a straight trench or an infiltration trench, which is, uh, uh, it is in this particular project, there's a, a, a clean drain rock, just open trench that all the downspouts and runoff goes to. But then the very top of it, they didn't want to have this just linear trench that looks like this. They wanted to have a landscape feature they could add to. Uh, and so they just added some of this clean rock, things that uh, uh, an aggregate that allowed water to still pass through it, uh, but wasn't going to uh, be anything that was uh, you know, too outside of something that they would like to have in there. So infiltration um, does those purposes can, can look uh, like something different on the top surface as well. Uh, here's another example of an infiltration system. Uh, the picture here, uh, or in the, uh, the middle of the picture here, up at the, the bottom of the deck, there's the downspouts that run into a, tr a trench that has fabric in it. Uh, once that trench fills, then it goes into a, a, a drain rock cell. That's at the top here. Then once that one fills, then it goes into the next one. And then once that one fills, and then it goes into the next one. This was specifically designed uh, to manage a certain amount of runoff that was added, uh, 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 a new roof surface that was added in this area. Uh, and it was really tricky because it was limited uh, space on site to manage that and then include this infiltration. And so this is a series of cells, but I like this picture because it illustrates the creativity that you can incorporate in these kinds of systems. Once this was all put in, then a, a clean gravel was put over top and they use this as a, as a driveway. 
access area for the backyard garden and things. So um, it, it, it's incorporated within what the homeowner already had planned, but there's all this stuff that's going down uh, below ground uh, that, that helps to manage that stormwater uh, and flow. Uh, here's a picture of uh, an infiltration patio. This patio has large flagstones and has aggregate that allows water to pass through it. Underneath this uh, patio surface is actually a clean drain rock. So it manages the downspout runoff and the runoff from the, the grass that is looking brown now because this is in the summer, but there is uh, a lot of water that flows through here in the winter. Um, but this uh, helps to manage that runoff that's coming through here, uh, but then they can still use it as a, as a patio surface. So there's all kinds of options that are out there. The technology has come a long way with pervious pavement and pervious patio. Uh, surfaces, uh, 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 and so there's different options, different colors and things like that um, that are out there now. Um, but that's uh, an example of an of a infiltrated patio or patio that infiltrates. Um, so the first picture here, it, a media filter drain. Um, these are very typical to what engineers and municipalities are putting on the side of roadway surfaces and things, but this is an example of what that would look like if you were to put that in just into an open area. Um, some of these types of uh, systems, MFD is the short term for that, but it's media filter drain, uh, is basically incorporates a specific media mix that they have water that flows through and it pulls contaminants and pollutants and things out of that water as it flows through it. So I'm gonna go through this and show you a quick example and just pull the pictures aside. Uh, to give you this demonstration as to what uh, ha, uh, how it would work on, on this type of scale. So um, a me th this is basically you dig a trench over here, you line it with a geotextile fabric, uh, and then uh, once that goes down, uh, you put uh, uh, this the aggregate material, which would be a media filter drain mix. What that mix is, is a um, uh, it's a crazy cocktail. No, it's um, it's a specific uh, mix of different kinds of uh, aggregate material, but also like calcite, coconut husks, and things like that. That uh, 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 carbon material and other things that I'm not totally sure of. Uh, that that they've demonstrated that pulls pollutants out of uh, stormwater uh, and things. So you uh, with this system, you open up that trench, you put the fabric down. You lay in uh, an uh, overflow pipe, which is down there at the bottom. You can see the very end of it. You put the aggregate material over top of that, and then you essentially uh, uh, cover it like a burrito. It's And that's the term that they like to use, is that then you cover that with that geotextile fabric. Uh, and then once that's covered, uh, then you uh, run um, uh, from the downspout and uh, uh, this would be the pipe that's illustrated here on the left of the picture there. Uh, that is a perforated pipe and that's coming directly from the downspouts and the input other driveway surfaces and things like that. Uh, and that's a, perf a perforated pipe that's level through that top of that trench. Uh, the, uh, the, the MFD or the mix is below the fabric. There's clean drain rock put on top. And then the perforated pipe is faced so the holes are facing upwards with a cap on the end. So the goal of these systems is, is that the water goes all the way through the pipe and then it exits out the pipe evenly across the whole entire trench, goes into the clean drain rock and then trickles down to that MFD mix. And then as it trickles down, it pulls contaminants out. It hits that other overflow perforated pipe that's at the bottom and then it goes out. And so your ending trench would look like this here where the downspout and the catch basin and then there's a driveway that goes through here goes into this basin, so it's a clean out, comes through here, it goes across underneath this drain rock bed, uh, and then in through your MFD. And this is, um, uh, it happens to be in a critical water area, uh, a critical area. So um, it, it, it uh, the overflow, it was very important that what was running off was perfectly clean. Um, you've got a clean out port there that you can see as well. So not to delve too much into the details of an MFD, but thinking about how these systems work, You've got your controlled inlet, which is over here by the black catch basin, so that you can see that the volume that's coming in. And then that picture uh, in the beginning, or you can kind of see it here in this one, uh, and the cursor, the overflow goes out. 
and then goes out to, to the lake what it, what it had done before, but as it goes through, it's catching all those contaminants. Passive rainwater harvesting, there's plants that go all around this. Uh, as that water goes through this, um, it, it expands out laterally, so it's helping to give water to the grass that's around there and things like that. Um, so it's adding uh, water and keeping it in the area that it otherwise would be used at the same time it's cleaning the pollutants and things that pass through it. So when thinking, when talking about active rainwater harvesting, it's the opposite. You're actually catching that water in a container to then be reused for another purpose. That's active rainwater harvesting. Here's a few examples of that. That middle picture is a typical rain barrel that you might see. You have a downspout filter on the side. The downspout comes down, goes into the, the rain tank. Uh, then when expanding the, the catchment systems, uh, you can put multiple tanks together. So the picture on the left there uh, is the same setup as this one, the middle one there. Uh, but as one tank fills, they're all connected at the bottom. So they equalize and then they fill up all as one unit. So you can have multiple bays or, or a larger bank of tanks that you connect together. And what's always great is those inexpensive blue rain barrels that are out there um, connecting a number of those if you've got a fence line or those kinds of things, tight space. Um, it's that same concept where you're connecting them together. They're all equal in height, so they can, if you connect them at the bottom, they equalize. Uh, the picture on the right is just an example of below ground tanks. Those are precast tanks, typical what you might see in like a septic application. Um, but the below ground tanks are, are uh, an option uh, for using for different rainwater catchment applications. In any rainwater catchment system, the most important thing is going to be your pre-filtration. And that's your filtration before going into your, your tank. So whether we're looking at a, 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 a system that's used for irrigation or it's a system that's used for potable use, uh, we always want to make sure that it has layers of pre-filtration uh, that are incorporated within the system. And pre-filtration is basically as it's uh, pictured there, you've got, you're catching that pine needles or organic debris uh, that would be collecting on your roof, getting into the gutters and, and flowing out with rainstorms and things. That holds the most amount of contaminants and uh, uh, other pollutants that you don't want getting and sitting in the tank. And so uh, having layers of pre-filtration is very important. Uh, downspout filters, whether it's gutter screening of different types, um, there's calming inlets, there's other kinds of uh, uh, ex uh, uh, specific things, things that are specific to rain catchment systems. But all it's trying to do is it's trying to keep that junk out of the tank. And then once it goes to the tank, uh, making sure that water's not stirred up in, in the, the storage tank so that things settle out, that, that it's clean when you're pulling the water from that storage. So pre-filtration is one of the most important things to a rain catchment system. Uh, and it helps to take the pressure uh, off of filtra uh, other filtration that you're trying to do uh, if you're using it for other uh, indoor use. Outdoor use is a very common thing. Uh, it, most people think of, when they think of rain catchment, they think of rain barrels. I like to describe the same thing like that, whether they're looking at very large systems that are doing um, uh, commercial applications uh, or a small rain barrel, it's just all a matter of scale. And so uh, uh, here's pictures of uh, different examples of above ground storage tanks that are used for outdoor use or, or typical outdoor use. Um, you, you might see uh, uh, these polyethylene tanks or, or the plastic ones in the lower left. There's the really nice corrugated steel tanks uh, that look really nice. Um, and there's different shapes and sizes all in between, but uh, above ground outdoor use is a very typical thing. And, uh, and I would imagine if we get to that point of the questions, um, when you're looking at using rainwater catchment for catching for outdoor use, uh, as long as this tank is not over 5,000 gallons and you, uh, you're, you're well within the ability to just be able to put that tank in and use that for those supplemental use. So there's no regulations with on using rainwater catchment for outdoor use. When you start to use it indoors, that's where uh, certain things like a plumbing permit for non potable use uh, uh, indoors or potable use, uh, it, it, there, there's other considerations to make and um, agencies or jurisdictions uh, uh, to uh, check with to make sure that you follow those permitting processes. So <clears throat> here's another example of an outdoor use tank. <clears throat> 
this uh, particular system here actually goes and uh, there's a water feature a pond that it just gravity feeds to. So as the pond evaporates, uh, it just fills water up. Um, you can see that the uh, downspout goes down and into the ground and then it comes up and then fills the tank. Uh, I won't get too far into the details, but there's a couple different methods of collecting rainwater in a tank. One is dry conveyance, where there's a downspout that goes directly to the tank, uh, like in this picture here, uh, uh, downspout directly into the tank. And then there's another system called wet conveyance, where you have this as a sealed piping. And then as the rainwater fills the pipe here, uh, it then goes into the lowest point, which would be your tank. So that's a wet conveyance system uh, that allows you to be able to put the tanks uh, uh, distances away from the downspout. Uh, so that's what that's illustrating there. Uh, so with then when thinking about using rainwater catchment for indoor usage, uh, you're really, uh, it, it depends on what that indoor usage is. Uh, if it's for non-potable, if it's for potable, uh, there's a couple of different components that would need to be associated with uh, each one of those. Um, but uh, uh, indoor usage, uh, rainwater catchment for indoor usage is permitted uh, in most counties, in fact, all counties in Washington state for non-potable use, uh, as long as you're following the proper plumbing permits and things. Uh, and then in others, it's for potable use in, in, in certain applications. So like a non-potable uh, 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 system or a pump system, uh, if you were to have a rain catchment uh, and you wanted to use it indoors for toilet flushing, uh, the non-potable uses indoors, that makes it very simple that you need a setup, just like it's pictured here, where you have a small sediment filter and a small booster pump, uh, you can use it to flush toilets uh, and do laundry. Um, when I talk to, uh, 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 when, when people are thinking about you putting in any kind of pump system for their rain catchment, uh, it, it's, all, it's really important, I think, to consider how to uh, uh, expand that usage or broaden that usage. And if there's options to be able to hook it up to toilet flushing, if you're putting a rain catchment system that has a pump uh, that uh, is just for irrigation, there's a short window that you're going to be able to use that storage tank for. Uh, unless you're putting in a large storage, depending on how much uh, irrigation capacity that you have in that summertime. So that means that that rain catchment and that pump system is sitting idle throughout the rest of the year, which could be eight, nine months, depending on when you start irrigating. And so if you're putting in a pump system, most, as I mentioned, most counties, most jurisdictions, they actually are looking at rain catchment for non-potable use as a really good um, it's a very simple process as one, uh, and then some areas are looking at it as a good option for helping to manage some of that uh, stormwater and then also water demand for those non-potable purposes. And so uh, this is a typical standard, what you might see booster pump, you'd have a sediment filter, uh, and then this red box here is a three-way valve. So uh, when your rainwater and your storage tank runs dry, uh, this valve will switch it over and then you have your municipal water. So that's the how you would integrate the system with your current water system uh, and not have to mess around when uh, the rainwater tank runs dry. So uh, just really quick, I'll briefly touch on rainwater for potable systems, but here's a couple of examples of some of the additional components that you would have. You'd have additional sediment, filtration, carbon, uh, and then an ultraviolet light is very important for sterilizing uh, the rainwater for bacteria and other uh, uh, things that would be present. But the, uh, these components uh, are the, uh, uh, beat, um, the, the code requirements for making rainwater catchment for potable use. Uh, so sediment filtration, then your UV uh, and, and such. So uh, another graphic uh, here, just really quickly to do, um, just, just throw some more numbers at you guys to make sure everybody's still awake. Um, so when thinking about, okay, one person uh, equals 50 gallons per day. That's not a standard rule. Uh, it's not a hard set, uh, but it is a rule of thumb in most counties that one person uses 50 gallons per day. Uh, and so that's about 18,000 gallons per year. This pie chart here uh, uh, shows the, how that breakdown roughly is, well, 
how that is all broken down uh, for that person's water use in a percentage throughout the day. And uh, I, what's most important to look at here is the non-potable purposes, the toilet flushing and clothes washing. This is an old, uh, these are old statistics, yes, um, but they haven't changed much from this. Uh, clothes washing machines are a little bit more efficient. It's brought it down to about 20 to 19% here. Uh, and then toilet flushing from this particular pie chart is a little bit less, 23, 20, 22 to 23. But most typically, toilet flushing and clothes washing uh, are uh, uh, over 30% or roughly 30% of what you'd be using indoors uh, on a daily basis. And that's that non-portable purpose. And so that's why uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, um, um, health departments and things that are looking at uh, rain catchment for non-portable toilet flushing uh, as an option. So to go back to that uh, picture again of the Skagit County and how much water that you can collect off a 1,500 square foot roof throughout the year, you can see it'd be more than enough uh, to fill up a storage tank, certainly throughout the uh, winter time for toilet flushing and things like that. Um, and so it, when integrating rainwater catchment and traditional water sources, uh, it, looking at the most important thing I think is uh, uh, those non-potable purposes that we're, that we're using water that's been filtered and treated and uh, then delivered back to us or uh, uh, pulled from the ground, uh, then treated in things for just to go through non-potable purposes to then be flushed out. Uh, and so integrating these two things is something that I think going forward, we're going to be seeing a lot more of this um, uh, municipal buildings and things incorporating uh, uh, rain catchment for urinal and toilet flushing and uh, school systems as well. Uh, so expanding from that smaller rain barrel concept uh, and then the rain catchment for irrigation to what other uh, applications could we see this in? And the Pacific Northwest is a very um, uh, ripe climate, especially with how much rainfall it can get uh, in these varying areas to uh, sufficiently support um, a lot of these water uses and usages and be a good water efficiency strategy. Um, so we talked about rainwater harvesting and stormwater management, went through a whole bunch of different examples of that um, uh, uh, things, but all centered around really uh, trying to address issues surrounding water quantity and water quality issues that, that, that we're seeing. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about how we calculate rainwater volume uh, and things and considerations that we make uh, uh, for uh, when we calculate the volume of, of runoff from an impervious surface uh, and the difference between active and passive rainwater harvesting, uh, catching that water in a rain tank to then be reused uh, or passive rainwater harvesting like rain gardens and, and uh, uh, bioinfiltration and things like that where the water is put right into the soil uh, to then be reused or to use by the plants at that time. Uh, so I'm gonna leave it open for questions. I've got my contact information up there. Um, I'm happy to uh, 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 answer any questions. I'm gonna do the stop uh, sharing because then I think I can, yes, see if there's any chats. Okay, very good, now I can see everybody. Okay, oh, we see your presentation. I'm sorry, I'm getting caught up on all of these. Yikes, scary. What is a waterfront emitter? Water frog emitter, okay, happy to explain that. A drip irrigation uh, emission device that delivers water slowly from the system to the soil. That's a great explanation. Um, yes, so the water frog emitter, it's actually a design that we put together. Um, I've got a video and I probably would lose you guys if I try and go and find it and everything. Um, it is through our YouTube channel. So if you go to our website, you can follow our YouTube channel and you can see what the water frog does. The wet conveyance system that I described, most uh, rainwater catchment uh, professionals down in the Southwest and down in Texas, an area where the industry is, is pretty well developed, it's been around for a while, they do a lot of their systems with wet conveyance, where they catch the water from the roof and then they convey it to a tank that's located farther away from that roof surface using hydrostatic pressure and gravity. So in that picture that I showed before, you see the downspout going through the uh, downspout filter. It goes into a sealed PVC pipe that then goes below ground. And then it comes back up and then feeds the top of the tank. So as the water passes through there, it's using gravity and hydrostatic pressure as it keeps filling to fill the tank. 
Well, what happens in the winter time is freezing issues. And that uh, has been a complication here in areas where it gets cold and freezing. And so the water frog emitter is a box that has uh, a, a, an emitter device that has a pinhole in it and a filter. And it allows water to flow to the storage tank when it's raining. And then when it stops raining, it emits that water over the course of about eight to 12 hours. So that conveyance piping is then completely drained out. That water, the water frog emitter also has a bypass valve incorporated in it that's tied into the overflow from your storage tank. So it actually acts as a pre-filtration component as well. And what we typically see, you can get a lot of information about rain tanks and rain catchment systems out there on the internet. But the biggest thing to think about in the Pacific Northwest, don't be fooled into putting in a first flush diverter. They're not necessary out here unless they incorporate um, thinking about the pollens and, ve and vegetation that we have out here in the Pacific Northwest. A lot of the first flush diverters have these little rubber gaskets with a pinhole in it, and they get clogged up throughout the year because of the cedar and the conifer pollen and things that we get. So it's really, uh, uh, with the water frog emitter, um, it's a different, it, it's, it, it's a different type of, uh, 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 it, it has a totally different purpose. It's designed specifically to drain that conveyance line for freeze protection. However, with that emitter, uh, it's, it concentrates the pollutants down to that water frog. And then that bypass valve uh, is something that you can open whether you're treating the roof or in the springtime when we get all of our pollens and the conifers drop all that yellow stuff everywhere over the, the, your car and the roof surface. That first bit of rain in the springtime that washes all that junk is going to have the most concentrations of that pollen. And so if you're diverting that from going to your storage tank, it's helping to keep that pre, it's part of that pre-filtration process. And so that's one application. And then of course, in the fall, you can do that when all the stuff drops and things, or if you're treating the roof for different applications, you can bypass that system. Whether you're, you can put a bypass in any system, it doesn't need to be a water frog. It's nice that the water frog has that all in one box in the unit, but it's specifically designed for that freeze protection component. So if you're thinking that the rain tank needs to be right up next to the roof surface, right up, uh, right up underneath the downspout, it doesn't have to be. And uh, doing a wet conveyance has a lot of benefits to it, and it, you're not adding a pump or anything to it. So it, it, there's, that, that's what that does. Any other questions? Yeah, take a look at our website. You can see uh, there's a there's a video that we've put together on the frog. It explains the, the concept. Wet conveyance is really what the, the concept that you're looking for, and there's a lot of information out there. Um, it's important to think about the the uh, what you're buying and the, the pre-filters and things that are out there, the, the size of the mesh screen. Uh, and the pollens that we're dealing with out here in the Pacific Northwest. So when you're going out and approaching it, if you're going to come away with anything in this presentation, uh, making sure that you have a pre-filter, you have a controlled inlet and a controlled overflow, uh, uh, and both of those are the same size. So if you've got two inch going in, you want two inch going out, uh, and that uh, you're considering the pollens and those kinds of things uh, uh, that we have here in the Pacific Northwest.